I'm usually pretty good at giving like a little two sentence Yelp review when someone asks what a specific convention is all about, but Katsucon is different. Despite this being my 11th Katsucon, I still have no idea how to sum up the bizarrely mythic status this convention holds. Luckily, this is YouTube, which is the one place where I don't have to be succinct. So we're gonna get into the history and lore of this almost 30-year-old event, and we also uh, are gonna go to it, because we love multitasking on this channel. Full disclosure, I had the idea to film a History of Katsucon video at Katsucon 2023, like two days before I left, so I did most of my script outlining on the Megabus from New York City down to DC. Katsucon has always held President's Day weekend in National Harbor, Maryland. I was gonna start this deep dive journey on Thursday night, but I forgot that hotel lighting bad for this kind of thing, so instead we engaged in the sacred Thursday night activities of last minute crafting to get ready for the weekend ahead, and then on Friday morning I grabbed my shitty hotel coffee and my tripod to welcome you on this journey. We've got our lovely view of the parking garage, and it's dreary and rainy out. This is also, I'm just telling you guys my Katsukan history. Yeah, um, you will get Yes, the peanut gallery. The peanut gallery, of course, includes three of my dearest and most beloveds. My con hotel roomies will be popping in and out of this video. I roomed with my dear friend, Noor, my darling angel, Cecily, and my girlfriend of almost five years, Little Mantis. She made those ears. Isn't she talented? If you see ears in this video, she made them, and also that's her job, so check them out. Katsukon started in 1995, and it was at a few other hotels. 2010 was the year that Katsukon moved to the Gaylord. I think the Gaylord is really what made Katsukon Katsukon. It is very hard to describe the Gaylord if you haven't been to the Gaylord because yes, it's a hotel, but it is a hotel resort and convention center. Atrium is the bottom level. Atrium is jungle area um, with the kind of little wooden flooring area and all the plants and the fountains. Then there is the lobby level that doesn't have a ton in it. And then there is the ballroom level that has the nice fancy black doors and the famous gazebo. And there is so much white marble. Everything has this kind of like very like elegant fake posh sort of aesthetic to it. So back in the early 20 teens, you've got to remember that like iPhone cameras at this time were ass. They were really bad. The digital point and shoots, I mean the shots that they captured of my cosplay were just absolutely tragic. But luckily at a space like Katsukon, because there was so much white marble and because the entire building is basically like an open kind of cube, it was basically like a giant softbox. So there was so much light being reflected and all of the photos, even if you had a kind of basic understanding of photography, looked super flattering. My first Katsukon was in 2011. Um, I had been to a few Otakons and I was in my full I'm a Ty Lee cosplayer era. And when I shot my cosplays in the Gaylord and started to get those photos back, I was like, oh my God, like I look like one of those really cool professional cosplayers. It was so easy to get really, really high quality photos in this really incredible high quality location. Also, let me be very clear. This is, have I fact checked this and researched this video? Yes but this is also primarily, this is a primary source. This is me telling the history of Katsukon as, as a person who was there for 11 years of it. This is not a documentary. This is like, I'm the person in the documentary. So if I say things that are just wrong or incorrect, or you're like, that's not, that's not how it worked. Um, fuck up my comments section. I know they're gonna be a mess on this anyway. When I think of Katsukon 2012, I think of Yaya Han's Carmella cosplay. She did this beautiful red ball gown that at the time was like probably the coolest cosplay I had ever seen someone make. So she did this shoot with Axe and Lee in the gazebo that in my opinion, started the lore of the Katsukon gazebo. Cause again, this was when attendance was a lot lower. So it was easy to get, you know, a really dramatic spinning around super well-lit gazebo shot without 500, you know, Deadpools and Spider-Mans climbing in to get in on the background. I did a My Little Pony cosplay that year. I have so many pictures from the Pony meetup. That was back when the My Little Pony fandom was like good. Those were the DeviantArt days. That was when most of the big cosplayers that I followed weren't people I followed on Instagram or Facebook. It was DeviantArt. The thing also about cons in this era is like you would go, you would have a fantastic time. And then in the week or so afterwards, it was a full-time job to try and find con pictures on Facebook, on DeviantArt threads, on cosplay.com threads, refreshing the pages, being like, who has a con dump photo? Because otherwise I didn't have cell phone pics and any pictures that I had on my digital point and shoot were a tragedy. They were very bad pictures. I think because of the Carmella cosplay, Katsukon started to become known as ball gown con. It became like, this is where you bring your ball gown. This is where you bring your really beautiful cosplays to get the beautiful shots in like the white marble and everything. And in 2013, 
I did bring a ball gown. I really thought in 2013 that that was gonna be my grand finale of cosplaying because that was the year that I graduated from college. So I was like, this is my last KatsuCon. Let me throw absolutely everything I have at this ball gown. I'm here now 10 years later. That was not my grand finale of cosplaying. 2013 was also the year that Angela Clayton invented Sakizo. That was the year that she wore her Sakizo, I think the Earl Grey cosplay. And she had detailed how she made all of that in a series of blog posts that I referenced heavily for many, many years. So we're gonna talk about Sakizo a lot in this video. Sakizo is a Japanese illustrator who made these really beautiful watercolor illustrations that were just kind of based on various themes. Like I believe there were some Alice in Wonderland illustrations. There was an afternoon tea series that was really popular. And they were just these really beautiful, really roughly, really romantic illustrations. And in this era, specifically at Katsukan, there started to be a lot of cosplayers that said, hey, I would like to make these, these are fun. They're not from an anime or a video game, but I think they're pretty and they will look really good at Katsukan. So Katsukan in this era started to become known as the Sakizokan. If you wanted to make a Sakizo, it would photograph really well in a place like Katsukan where you've got that massive soft box of the whole building and you've got a lot of nice couches and a lot of beautiful architecture. The early 20 teens in general were a time when cons were going through a really big shift. As someone who started in 2009, 2010, back then, you really only cosplayed from anime and Japanese media at Japanese conventions, which Katsukon definitely is. You cosplayed from comics at comic conventions. They were very separate and they were very focused. With things like, it's Homestuck. It's always been Homestuck. Homestuck changed cons for the better, and that is my f***ing hot take in this way, because Homestuck opened the doors for people to cosplay things that weren't just anime and video games, things like Sakizo, things like illustrations, things like redesigns. I do think we have Homestuck to thank for that, and also the Locked Tomb books. Because at this time, Katsukon also wasn't that crowded, it was still a pretty small base of mostly cosplayers that had some connection to the DMV area. This was also the area when CMV's cosplay music videos started to take off. I think of Axon Lee as the founder of cosplay music videos, I also think of Beatdown Boogie, uh, Legend of Micah as the founders of this time. Axon Lee is still out there and still doing CMVs. Beatdown Boogie is now run by different people from the person who originally founded it. Um, the person that actually pioneered most of the incredible work on that channel is Micah, who now makes content under Legend of Micah. When you look back on the beautiful CMV is the like slow motion, spinning around detail shots that were like totally pioneered at Katsukon. It is astonishing how empty the Gaylord was back in that time. Mm -hmm. I remember when you could just stop and get shots pretty much anywhere in those first few years, and that is that is not the case anymore. You also might notice that we are however many minutes we are into the video right now, um, and I haven't mentioned actually anything about the convention itself. Everything that I've talked about has been the venue and the culture of cosplays that people bring to the venue and the way that people shoot the cosplays and share the cosplays in the venue. I have not mentioned anything like panels or programming, or the vendor hall, or anything that actually has to do with Katsukon, about Katsukon. And this is this is on purpose, this is not an oversight, and we will talk more about that later. I'm getting in Korok now, that's what's happening. It's like noon, it's the perfect time to get in cosplay. As it starts raining, that's when you want to start getting in your cosplay. And I'm hand sewing on the garter because the garter doesn't want to stay up, and I didn't feel like making shorts. My Korok cosplay was one of my big projects last year, and by now I've worn it a few times, so that means I did a really bad job getting footage of me in it. This cosplay is honestly pretty comfy to walk around in, but it isn't really great for hanging out and chatting because it is super difficult to hear and be heard in it. Originally, I'd planned on wearing this all day Friday, but literally seven minutes before I left my apartment, I ended up throwing another cosplay in my suitcase, specifically for a 4.30 p.m. meetup on Friday. So once it started to get later in the afternoon, I knew my Zelda moment was up and it was time to become a terrible lesbian necromancer from space. So it's 2.40 and I'm, I'm changing out of Korok. I was only in it for like Yeah, okay, so two hours. Yeah, two hours. So we're changing into Ianthe. Costume number two. I'm still young. 
I'm a young cosplayer. I can wear multiple cosplays in one day. So 2014, I think 2014 is where we're coming back. It was nothing like the con we're experiencing today because in 2014, there was a massive snowstorm. My bus got canceled actually going to KatsuCon. I had to rebook for a 5 a.m. Monday bus coming down to the National Harbor and just roll up on Friday morning instead of getting here Thursday night. I remember just like lugging my suitcase full of, of cosplays through the streets of New York City and making it here and getting some beautiful snow pictures of my dwarf, of, of Ori from the Hobbit movies. Cause that was back when the Hobbit movies were happening and we thought it might be good. <laughs> it was another time. It was another time. It, was, it snowed in winter and we had hope about the Hobbit movies. In 2014, my other big cosplay is that I did a big group with my friend Kit Sunset Dragon because she had designed Galloping Gala, My Little Ponies. And I slid into that group as their Queen Chrysalis. This was another like with the Sakizos uh, in the mid to early 20 teens, there were a lot of artists First it was Sakizo and then it turned into like No Flutter and Hannah Alexander and Sunset Dragon that would do these designs of existing characters that started to be a thing that people did at conventions. Before this, it was not super common to see like redesigns of things. And I think that these artists that did design so cosplayers didn't have to be designers and crafters really helped popularize that. 2015, I decided that I would make a Sakizo. Um, and it was, I, that Sakizo to me is like, I think of that as like the most miserable cosplay experience I've ever had. If you've been hearing me talking about how like Katsukon is all about where like cosplayers bring their A game and they show off like their best cosplay and you're thinking like, wow, that sounds like nothing could ever go wrong with that kind of mindset. Then you just haven't watched enough anime. In 2015, when I started working on my Sakizo, I liked the design. I found a teapot illustration that I was really into. I love tea, so I was like, this is gonna be a lot of fun. But looking back on it, like, I didn't have that big, like, cosplayer love that was connecting me to it. I was more just seeing everyone else around me doing Sakizos at KatsuCon, getting a good response on social media. So I was like, if I wanna be taken seriously as a cosplayer, I need to make a Sakizo. I was so unhappy with the final product. I machine sewed in my hotel room in the Gaylord for half the weekend. I think it's a thing that like we should talk about more that when you're a beginner cosplayer, you know, you're like improving leaps and bounds. And every time you make something, you're like, oh my gosh, I made this. Like I'm wearing a thing that I made. That is so cool. And then once you kind of hit the point of being an intermediate cosplayer, then it can become more difficult because you don't have that same like, oh my gosh, I made the skirt. I'm wearing something that I made. You just sort of feel like, of course I can make a skirt. I've been doing this for three years. Then you start to be like, I should make a better skirt. I've been doing this for four years. Look at this other cosplayer that's also been doing this for four years I should be at that level that was what I was using as my like um, rubric not things that made me happy these are my these are my props now I guess these are your maracas, <laughs> these are my maracas. <laughs> oh they are your maracas I apologize oh my god how could you how could you I don't care well, the problem with you being in these shots is that everyone is going to see you and be like, oh no, how did, like, they're, she's way out of Lizard's League. This isn't, this isn't fun. That's <laughs> a lie. Face. That's a dirty lie. No, that's, I can't lie. Yes, you know you I can't can. lie. You lie all the time. <laughs> a room full of deceit. <laughs> Lies and deception. Oh my God. Yeah, I barely saw you that con. I, I know. Like, I know and it's like and I wore that cosplay once I truly like I wore it and I was so like this wasn't worth the months of effort I put into it and like the pictures were great yeah, you know great like it, but I could tell you weren't happy yeah I wasn't happy that's yeah. the thing and it's very it feels so cliche to be like I wasn't happy because I was comparing myself to others but it's like no that's real like that was very much yeah. what happened I made the same exact mistake again in 2016 I thought it was going to be different I was like oh I will just cosplay from my favorite book series of all time and they're books that you know we're not gonna touch on any further in this video because we've we've thrown them in the trash along with along with turfs I was making this cosplay of my absolute favorite mom and I designed this super elaborate look 
And I spent weeks making the petticoat and making the corset and using like the most time consuming techniques, drafting all of my own patterns. I didn't do anything to like save time or make things more efficient or like save myself suffering because I thought that the suffering was what made it a good cosplay. The culture of cosplayers bringing their absolute best work to Katsukon because it's such a gorgeous location has resulted over the years of this happening in this kind of like arms race amongst cosplayers. Cosplayers feel like they need to always be bringing a cosplay that represents the absolute peak of their skill that is like the flashy costume of this year and it burns people out and I see it still harming a lot of cosplayers who dream of going to Katsukon because it has this reputation. It feels like now that I'm out of it like it feels so clear to be like oh I just spent years in that middle Pokemon just being miserable and like not being able to name that that was why I was miserable, you know? Because it was like, you're like, no, I don't care what anyone thinks. I cosplay, like, obviously I don't care. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be any of us, <laughs> yeah. That was just my personal experience in 2015 and 2016. But something else happened in 2016. That was the year the Fire Nation attacked. Hi, we're doing, um, we're doing makeup now. <laughs> it's, we're doing Eanthe Tridentarius from the Locked Tomb books. For the meetup. To be clear, if I look like a busted mess, I'm supposed to look like a busted mess. I'm not supposed to look good. I'm supposed to look horrible and anemic. We last left off uh, talking about how in 2016 the Fire Nation attacked, which is you were not there for that. No, I wasn't. Oh my! I Did you hear about it. this? Everyone okay. Heard about this. Yes. <laughs> Everyone heard about this on Saturday noon-ish. I think the fire alarm started to go off and continued to go off. This was a year again, not like current times where it's warm and rainy sub-freezing temperatures. It was a thing that people laughed about, but like it was not funny at the time because there were people in, you know, armor bikinis that had to go and like be out in the parking garage. I remember there being people like with coats that were like trying to help people that were not warm enough, like cover up. My also personal story, because this is a first person source. I was here for everything that I'm talking about in this video. Um, I was still getting on my Narcissa Malfoy cosplay because this was the, the year that I was like, I won't have mental problems if I'm cosplaying from Harry Potter, obviously. Hello. Oh, it's about rain on. oh no. We had an atrium view balcony room. So I heard the alarm and I was fully like, that sounds like something. I should go check this out. And we kind of looked out and could see that people were still there. So I was like, okay, but I'm just gonna keep putting on my makeup. So I just kept putting on my makeup. A full like 20 minutes later, the alarm is still going off and we're like, oh, that's weird. A while later, we're like, oh, people have left. People have evacuated actually. Maybe this was not the right move. <laughs> but we were still, this is, don't do this kids. I wanna be clear. This is, don't be influenced by me. Don't do this. If you hear a fire alarm, leave. So we finally heard someone coming through the hallway being like, you gotta go, like we're evacuating, like the, the fire alarm is going off. And so we finally were like, okay, let's go. So I was only outdoors for like 15 minutes. The entire hotel had evacuated, not just like the con floor, the like the hotel itself. I, I think that whatever the actual answer is to like why the fire alarm went off is like boring. There's nothing spicy. It wasn't like a, a con person pulled the fire alarm or whatever. It's just like, sometimes fire alarms go off. 2016 was also the year of the Jessica Negri, the Glad ZK Evolutions group. Um, when it was Jessica Negri. I love saying these things and hearing everyone around me being like, oh yeah, that was what happened that year. So that was a really big armored group with designs that Glad ZK did of the Evolutions. My friend Becca Noel was in it. Um, Jessica Negri was in it. I, for me personally, I think of that group as the beginning of like this idea that like cosplays go viral like Hatsukon. The thing about the Evolutions group though that you've got to remember is that these were not unknown cosplayers coming into the Gaylord who just kind of stumbled upon viral fame, right? This was already Jessica Negri and Glad ZK, people that had massive followings in 2016. People that had photographers that knew that they were going to be there, that knew that they were making these gorgeous, beautifully made cosplays that were ready to have photos, that they were ready to publish on sites like Kotaku and say, here's some of the best cosplay at Katsukon. So this idea that like you can go mega viral at Katsukon has always been flawed. It's how do people talk and do makeup at the same time? I 
I, this is not good makeup and I'm gonna need to shut the f up at some point. Yeah, there's a few 2016 things I forgot to mention. For starters, the fact that the reason why we call the hours long fire alarm ordeal the Fire Nation attack is because a group of God tier avatar cosplayers on Sunday made this sign. Honestly, this is peak con culture. The fact that they modified their cos plans in real time to make a joke about something that just happened. 2016 was also, in my experience, the year that you first started to really see in the days and weeks after Katsukon, a lot of online discussion about nighttime attendee behavior. We're talking about con goers getting rowdy and partying in the lobby or their rooms and ultimately doing property destruction. We're going to talk more about the growth of Katsukon party culture in a bit, but 2016 was the first year that people documented and called out this behavior, and I do think these pictures speak for themselves. So after after 2015 and 2016 being like kind of gnarly years making mistakes with cosplay, I think of 2017 as the year that I got really back on track, and I did that through the magic of Yuri on Ice. I and my friend Nami decided that we were gonna do Victor and Yuri, and we decided that we were gonna like coordinate, use the same pants patterns, like buy our fabrics at the same time, buy our rhinestones together, and we had such a fantastic time making these cosplays that were like just about becoming those characters. That that meetup, the energy of the 2017 Katsukan Yuri on Ice meetup, uh, unparalleled. Like truly one of the best all-time con meetups. I'm gonna try and do eyeliner while I tell you about the gummy bear story. Editing Lizard jumping in because I think I'm gonna do a better job explaining this than eyeliner struggle Lizard. So let me paint you a POV style picture. It's February 2017. You remember all the photos from last year's call-out posts and hearing how terrible all those other cosplayers were at Katsu. You're scrolling social media on con weekend when you see a picture someone has posted of two Rubbermaid totes full of gummy bears sitting in a Gaylord hallway. There's a little handwritten note that says something like, do not eat these, they were used in a bathtub shoot. And the picture caption is like, oh my god, these cosplayers at KatsuCon filled up a bathtub with gummy bears and left the mess in the hallway for staff to clean up. And I mean, you can see the totes. You know from last year how rowdy KatsuCon is, so you believe this and show it to all your friends and the gummy bear incident is born. Objection. But this isn't what really happened. Here are the facts. Some cosplayers brought a huge amount of gummy bears to take some aesthetic boudoir photos. When they were done shooting, they tried to get a cart to dispose of the bears. Hotel staff said they would handle it, so just leave them outside the room and they'll take care of it. The cosplayers and photographers left a note on the bears so no one would eat them, and that's when someone snapped and posted the viral pic. That's it. That's the story. That's how people literally following staff instructions after a fun little shoot became a full-blown scandal. The grain of truth of there being some property damage in 2016 meant that a year later in 2017, people were primed to believe an out-of-context, inaccurate story on social media. Katsukan's reputation as a place where legendarily bad choices were made was established and growing. And over the many years of Katsukan, that grain of truth to misinformation to urban legend pipeline has built up a wild number of con legends that I literally cannot verify. The, the out of control Mario orgy. Someone pooped in the gazebo. There's stories, someone broke a planter. And that one specifically people were like, everyone lost their minds being like, can you believe a Katsukon guest broke one of the marble planters that has one of the trees? And it turns out it was the hotel staff that did that. So at this point we've like established the duality of Katsukon, that it is both a place where you should take your cosplay that you spent 500 hours perfecting, and it's also a place where you should go get blackout drunk and dismantle an exit sign, you know? I'm jumping in to say that I realized that I need to shut the f*** up so that I can get this makeup done in time. That's all, that's all I have to say. <laughs> the problem with being very on top of like, brow trends in fashion is that now I look back on the way I did my brows even in 2019 and I'm like, what was I thinking? What was the thought process? Does this look like the right amount of f***ed up? Yeah! yeah! I look like sh Big, I haven't slept because I'm trying to gain the, the approval of my parental figures, who are also lictors. Now I look f***ing horrible. Yeah. Done. Easy peasy. Solid. Wig and shirt time, I think. And off I go, sprinting out the hotel door to get to the meetup. Meetups at conventions can sometimes be pretty unremarkable unless a fandom is particularly new or rabid. The Locked Tomb fandom is both. I already made a whole other video about how these books changed my brain chemistry if you want the full download, but the TLDR for Katsukon is that these books make me feral and there remains no better experience in life than connecting with other people who also lie awake at night thinking about these characters and this world and the story. 
It makes my heart so happy to see a book fandom thriving at a con like this. But man, I cannot exaggerate how cold I was in a completely sheer shirt and gale force winds. Could not feel my fingers. I stayed out way too long, just like talking and hanging out with people I was mostly meeting for the first time. Honestly, it's so magical to me that over a decade later, even though so much about the way I cosplay is totally different, the experience of just rolling up to a meetup and being excited to get in-character photos with people is still just as exciting. Like this Augustine cosplayer and I recreate a single line from the books that's so ah after the meetup i followed the sacred guidance that human beings at con require one hot meal a day and got some 12 dollars chicken tendies took a shower went out to be social out of cosplay fun fact my girlfriend and i met a katsukon five years ago i'm a stupid lesbian and i knew i wanted to date her immediately so i pulled to the like oh my god let's get a selfie moment and that means that now we can look at these pictures exactly five years apart like to the hour It is Saturday, I was gonna say morning, but it's Saturday, 1.30 in the afternoon. So after hanging out with friends last night, I'm also fact checking a few of the stories that I already told in this video. I forgot about the time that someone allegedly put soap in the fountains. I also forgot about the lava lamp incident, which I'm which I'm not gonna talk about too much because I don't wanna get demonetized. I'm also getting in my Flick cosplay, which um, I have not worn at a convention yet, and I forgot that I was supposed to be getting in that while I was talking. So 2018 KatsuCon was after 2017 where I had had the, you know, great Yuri on Ice experience and had kind of been like, hey, actually, I can like have fun at this convention without completely losing my mind. So 2018, yes, I still did the Katsu Crunch and I still, you know, pulled a lot of all-nighters, but they were just different all-nighters. They were all-nighters where I knew that my like sense of self-worth was not attached to the way that this silly little Pokemon turned out. And this silly little Pokemon turned out great. 2019 KatsuCon was probably the biggest like discrepancy between my personal experience at KatsuCon and everyone else's. The next few like seconds, minutes are gonna be talking about my experience losing my dad. So if you don't wanna watch that, I'll put some timestamps down here. In 2019, I was working on a Charlotte cosplay from Madoka Magica. And because it was just a few months after I lost my dad, it was a very like healing, like grief oriented process. Oh, also major spoilers for Madoka Magica. Charlotte is a character that kind of like represents the randomness of death. So me working on this Charlotte cosplay was like a hugely healing process. I was like, wow, I'm coping with the loss of a parent. I'm going to make a giant monster puppet for a few months and that's how I'm going to handle my feelings. Honestly, I'm keeping the Charlotte story pretty short here on purpose. When you go to an event every year for over a decade, like I have for KatsuCon, you end up being a lot of different versions of yourself over all that time. A trauma like losing a parent divides your life into before and afters. When I look back on my life in 2018 and 2019, that dividing line is what I think of, so KatsuCon is included in that. And just acknowledging that is important to me because I think it makes the world a worse place when we edit out the experience of death and loss. So that's what was happening for me, but a lot of other things were also happening in 2019 for all of us. In 2019, a bunch of cosplayers um, decided to have an off-site event at the MGM Casino, separate from KatsuCon. They called this event S-Class, but basically it was going to be, you know, some photo shoots, some hanging out, some partying, a lot of things that happen with KatsuCon. And this shouldn't have been a big deal. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time, you know, cosplayers schedule off-site shoots. I've been a part of plenty of off-site shoots. Where things started to get a little wibbly is that there was a lot of kind of hype around this. I remember there was a Kotaku article that came out that was like, is cosplay outgrowing conventions? And was this really kind of glowing puff piece about organizers are frustrated by the programming at anime cons, they're making their own events. I found the article again, and honestly, it's so much worse than I remembered. God, every convention is the goddamn same. Then you staff, stab you in your sleep if given the chance. Adding a luxury top tier, it's not good. S-Class Weekend was so weird to me because like planning to do photo shoots in really cool locations and also having a venue for hanging out and partying at night is great. 
That's literally what cons are about. I think that rocks. And Katsukon in particular doesn't offer a lot in their programming, which we still haven't talked about. I promise it's coming up soon. It's not elitist to want to hang out with your friends and have a good time. And I have plenty of close friends who went to the MGM because, you know, that's where their crew was. I went to the MGM that year. My super talented photographer friend that I booked for my Charlotte cosplay uh, suggested the location. And I was happy to pay for an Uber and get some pics in a place where they had more control over lighting. But that's exactly the thing, right? Going to the MGM was only a thing you did if you already knew someone going. It was friends and friends of friends. I didn't even hear about it until I got to the con that year. And especially when that extended friend network hyping up S-Class Weekend includes a lot of cosplayers who have a ton of clout and influence. It's literally like the opposite of the magic of rolling up to a con meetup that's open to everyone. I'm not trying to resurrect like four-year-old beef. There was a lot of blowback from this article and specific from other cosplayers calling this attitude really elitist. I hope that in the like four years since it was published, the organizers have done some reflecting on why this came across so poorly to a community that is so much wider than a single friend group. Events at the MGM have happened in the years since, but they've been way more normal compared to 2019, probably because of how discoursey the whole thing became back then. 2019 was also um, the year of the teeth. I was trying to fact check this up until this morning, and I could not find anything besides people were handing out teeth at KatsuCon. Were they human teeth? Were they replica teeth? Was it one person handing out the teeth? Was it multiple people handing out the teeth? If you know, once again, f*** up my comments. Luckily, I do not need to be super precise with this wig because there is a hood that is gonna cover up all of the back, so I'm just focusing on getting the front looking decent. 2020 was, for most people, the last thing that we did before a lot of things happened in 2020. You know, we didn't know that it was gonna be the end of an era at the time, um, but I think that Katsukon 2020 was a really solid and beautiful end of that era of cosplaying. I think of one of the big groups of 2020 as being the um, Carnival Disney princesses. They have these pictures of them on the stairs by the escalators and they're like absolutely stunning. I was making that year my D&D session, but in the style of like a fantasy Zelda merchant. That was a crunch. I made that thing, honestly, in about a month. It was like crowdfunded with help with people on my Kofi, helping me cover materials costs. I pulled many an all-nighter to make that silly backpack. And to date, I think that that is like probably the best cosplay debut I have ever done. I very consciously went high and not wide because I know by now that a wide ball gown at KatsuCon is a recipe for destruction stable are we? We're pretty stable. Oh, I need an ibuprofen. So that was our last hurrah it was Katsukon 2020. Katsukon 2021 didn't happen. Katsukon 2022 did happen. Um, and I did not go to it because I just knew that I wasn't in the place for it. So that was the first year I'd skipped to Katsukon in over a decade. And here I am in 2023. Speaking of wide ball gowns, I completely forgot to talk about one of the best things about present era Katsukon. So it's Editing Lizard, hi, here to explain the cosplay Met Gala. It started when someone on Twitter joked that Katsukon is just the Met Gala for cosplayers, referring to the fundraising gala hosted by the Met Museum of Arts Costume Institute. This event always features innovative and high concept fashion, so comparing it to Katsukon's A game is pretty apt. That Twitter convo was the jumping off point for some veteran cosplayers to say, hey, we should do that. The idea was to have a meetup event not for a specific fandom, but instead for original cosplay designs. It can be tough for cosplayers who self-design to compete with those builds since accuracy to source material is usually a criteria for judging. So this was going to be a place for original designs to actually get some spotlight. In 2020, Regan of the Merry Cosplay Duo Cowbutt Crunchies held the first cosplay Met Gala with Jedi Manda and Utopian Pigeons, Giant Speaker. I think this event just rocks so hard. Living through a decade of Katsukon cosplay evolution, it's so, so sick to see just how many cosplayers in present day are bringing high-level design and high-level craftsmanship to this con. I love that the event is open sign-up, and I love that it combines a runway walk portion with a social mixer. This year I couldn't go because it was the exact same time as I was getting my ass blasted all over the waterfront lawn, but I've absolutely loved seeing the inspiring creative work other cosplays are doing. I'm not affiliated with the event, I'm just biased, and I think it's f***ing cool and literally highlights everything I love about what cosplay has grown into. But hey, while we're here, let's finally talk about programming, because the Cosplay Met Gala, despite now three years of successful turnout, despite being well organized and developing a really vibrant community and representing literally the things that Katsukon is known for, is still just a meetup by the fountains without a more official con-affiliated space. 
One of the reasons why it's so hard to describe Katsukon is because the con that exists in the hearts of the people that go to it is so completely separate from the con that Katsukon Entertainment Incorporated thinks it is running. Okay, I can't waste your time anymore. I'm just gonna say it. I think Katsukon is a bad con. The programming for present day Katsukon feels like it never left 2011 weeb culture. I don't hate that maid cafes and AMV contests are still happening, but the fact that their programming is pretty much all stuff like that is wild. The artist alley is good. I'm sure that there are some panels that are great and every once in a while there will be a cool guest. But it's hard to even enjoy that when badge pickup lines are so long that people often don't end up getting their badges until the cons half over. To me though, Katsukon's most spectacular failure is their complete lack of nighttime programming. No other present day con offers so little to do at night. At Dragon Con, you can choose from like three to five different themed dance parties on any given night. At Holiday Matsuri, you can see a whole burlesque show if you check out the Hottest Men in Anime panel. And at Magfest, my personal favorite con, you can check out the massive arcade and the artist alley and the concerts and panels into the wee hours of the morning. At Katsukon, you can go to some hentai panels. That's like it. So yeah, most attendees end up hanging out in the lobby or going to room parties. I don't think Katsukon is inherently rowdier than other cons, I just think that there is nowhere for that rowdiness to go. Attendees have to basically make their own con experience for the weekend because the con won't adapt to the times and respond to what their attendees actually want. I would love for this to change. I would love for Katsukon to get on board with the con that the rest of us have actually been going to for a dozen years and not this super narrow, extremely dated otaku convention. I would love for this con to learn how to actually use the beautiful venue they have. I would love for Katsu itself to just suck less. But that's a question for the ghost of Katsukon future, so let's check back in on the uh, ghost of Katsukon present. So that just about brings us up to present, and it is like two o'clock on a Saturday. Um, I'm very behind schedule as, as per my usual. I'm just about done getting in my Flick cosplay. I haven't worn him at a con yet and I am very, very excited to to do that. I was working on a whole new cosplay that I was hoping to get done in time for Katsukon, but about 10 days out, I looked at what needed to get done and I said, you know, it's not gonna happen. So instead I took those 10 days to keep working on it without pulling any all-nighters and that was a great decision. Character growth. You know, honestly, I'm just gonna tell you about it because I'm excited. Um, the new cosplay that I was working on was what if Lavender Town had a witch? I think the design concept is so cool and I'm really, really excited about it. And that is gonna be a whole series to look forward to this year. I'm gonna go tape some horns to my head and uh, film some TikToks. Thanks for hanging out with me in the hotel room. I am gonna go out and hit the con floor for the first time at 2.34 in the afternoon. I do this every year, God. The con floor was indeed hit by my Flick cosplay. I think it's so funny that my girlfriend was cosplaying a moth on the day that I was cosplaying a bug obsessed lizard. It's just too real. Flick was super comfy and I loved having my full field of vision on Saturday. It was unbelievably crowded. I learned researching this video that Magfest, which takes place at the same hotel, actually has more attendees than Katsukon, but you'd never know it because at Magfest, everyone is doing so much stuff in different spots and at Katsukon, everyone is just kind of vibing just doing some laps. We had our annual Nando's date. We eventually changed out of cosplay and shifted into nighttime shenanigans mode. The next day we checked out and got into our Steven Universe cosplays. Hilariously, there was a brief fire alarm evacuation on Sunday. This time it was funny because it was super nice outside and because it didn't last that long. Definitely not the Fire Nation's full force. I feel like as I've been making this extremely biased folk history, I keep forgetting that I am also capturing history with this. Like this is Katsukon 2023. When people look back on this year, they might mention the Sunday fire alarm. They might mention the rumor that someone pooped in the gazebo that was definitely making the rounds again like it does every year. They might mention the CVS Chan cosplay that got pretty popular online. I do think cosplays like this with a lot of surface area need to be really careful about obstructing walkways, especially in a con as crowded as Katsu. Like I truly hope this person had a handler to make sure no one slipped or tripped, but I gotta love that this cosplayer included a ton of Katsukon specific jokes in the trailer. They might mention the horrible Attack on Titan cosplayer on Friday who was outside looking like a Nazi and very loudly shouting about being a Nazi. That was real, it really happened, and f*** that guy. I hope you get banned from this con forever, and I hope other things that I can't say on YouTube. It never fails to astonish me how Katsukon manages to capture truly some of the ugliest and most hateful parts of nerd culture 
right alongside some of the most beautiful. I mean, I've seen cosplay grow from a niche gaggle of nerds doing their best with Chicken Wire and Joanne's Polly Satin to a vibrant, thriving community of some of the most technically skilled craftspeople around. And I've also seen that same drive to craft beautiful things become the double-edged sword of the Katsu Crunch. When it comes to Katsukon, there are no tidy conclusions. There is mess and there is drama and there is triumph and friendship and so much more that slipped through the cracks of even this enormous video. I've only been able to find one thing that brings together the highs and lows of what happens in this silly little hotel, and it's that they are our highs and lows. The culture of Katsukon and the lore that has been built up over all these years was built by us, the attendees in a community that can be really vulnerable to the whims of media conglomerates and IP restrictions, that means something. And it also means that we have the power to focus our energy and passion on what matters to us and create the future we want to see for this con. We will make it happen. We'll turn it around. Yes, we were born to make history. I'm so sorry, I, I had to, I had to. For me, I'm probably going to look back on 2023 as the year that I decided to throw together like an overambitious film project with almost no planning. I wouldn't be able to randomly take on projects like this without the support of my members on Ko-fi. These edits are so labor intensive and your support is the only way I can keep making deep dives like this. I literally appreciate each and every one of you more than I could put into words. I want to give a thank you especially to Gloop Dee Doo, Stephanie C, Eli, Perchancy Cosplay, Hust, Nami Sparrow, Toria Toria Toria, and Ryan. You are the wind beneath my wings. I've got to thank my hotel roomies again for letting me take over the room and shout about the ancient lore of early 20 teens cosplay culture. I love you all so much. And of course, thank you for watching. You are helping support this channel just with your precious, beautiful eyeballs. If you enjoyed this, a like and a comment really do help me out a ton. And if you want to stick around to see what I'm making next, I would be honored if you subscribed. But really, just thank you for making it to the end of this absolutely colossal edit. It means so, so much. And with that, the countdown to Katsukun 2024 is on, so I'll see you there in the future, same place, same time, next year, and hopefully for many more beyond that. My famous f***ing last words, I'm hoping this is going to be a shorter video, we'll see. <laughs> it's not going to be 40 minutes. If this is under 20, that would be beautiful. We'll see. We'll f***ing see.